Ooh, all right. All right, so we're going to finish analyzing, learning from the forest. It's kind of tiny, heavy, symmetric. And we look before at what each one, uh, what each of these words mean. And I guess I can still see my diagram over here, which is good. I can just follow it. This one was the the prime axis, also known as, aka the vertical. And we had um, the top. With the principal moment of inertia that is different than the other two. In this direction. So this one gave us the tilted, rotated z-axis. So this one is aligned with the with the spin, so the rotation that goes like this. And so goes in this direction. So counterclockwise, the other angles were theta over here. So the angle between uh, Z prime and Z and so the angle between the vertical and the axis of rotation. And then we had this one over here, which is uh, phi and I guess then it's a little bit difficult to draw over here, but we had another rotation kind of over here that we called Psi, the line of nodes. And why is the line of nodes important? Well, if your rotation is 313, which is what is common in mechanics, uh, vibrational and rotational motion of molecules, and the book. You have first your knob over here, and then this is your second knob, and then this is your, your third knob. But this line of notes is the intersection between the plane of reference and the plane of the, well, I guess what is normal to, uh, to the rigid body that you're analyzing or to you know, the planet that you're looking at. So, line of notes, 
And those are our three angles. So the last one, along psi, it's, uh, I mean, along the axis of rotation, it's psi. OK. Cool. We had a torque, and the torque was given by the torque was given by um, R, capital R, which is the distance from the origin to the center of mass cross the force produced by gravity, which is uh, total mass, and then uh, the acceleration due to gravity. So we, end up, we ended up with, uh, with this expression, mgl. L is the distance from the origin to the center of mass. So I guess is the magnitude of R, and it's in the direction, well, I'm going to put it over here. This one was k hat prime cross k hat. What direction is that with respect to the drawing, for example? Hmm? The line of notes. Yep, line of notes. So we have, it's going to be the direction that is perpendicular to the plane created by the vertical, well, the axis of rotation and the vertical, right? So it's going to be like this. Uh, it can be rotated like this, right? But it's always in this direction, the line of notes. So, I guess another important uh, role that the line of notes is uh, following <clears throat> So we know the equations, or I guess the system of equations for um, I guess what the torque is going to produce So it's going to be <coughs> I guess I can put it over here. This one up to okay. So this is in body axis axes. Um, this is also in body axis. So what components of the node, I mean the, um, the torque, 
um, are zero and which ones are not. <coughs> Help me. Which one? The third one. Why? Because the door is perpendicular. Okay. What else? In the process of rotation, the line of nodes, I guess. Here we're calling it psi because we don't want to be, we don't want to get confused. But what direction is that? Over here you have the z-axis, axis, and then in what direction do you have y and x? And we're gonna help you a little bit. This is X. Out of the plane. Well, if you're rotating it like this, uh, this is the the Y Z plane. So this one is also zero, and this one is the one in which we actually have a component of the torque. This one. So we perform a similar analysis. Last time, it was for the more general system. But let's see what happens here. The symmetry that we have, that we are enforcing, is I1 equals I2 different than I3. So, this one is one. Wait. Uh, this one is one. But there's a question. Doesn't the line of nodes has doesn't the line of nodes have components in x prime? Well, in x and y, because we still have to replace <coughs> the line of nodes in x and y. So remember that the last rotation doesn't do anything, right? It's a spin. So I couldn't even draw it. I had to put an arrow. So you start here, right? And you rotate it um, like this. So what it does is it produces this one. Now you have x here, y here, and z over here. And the next thing that you do is move it like this which is the line of nodes right along x. And then you do that. The next one is just like this. So x, the line of nodes, still there. Mm -hmm. the, the new line of nodes wouldn't be then uh, perpendicular to the plane of C and prime. Perpendicular to Z? To the both C. To this one and this one? Yes, because when, when, we, when we rotate that one, it moves like this. So it's no longer perpendicular to the original C. Uh, it is perpendicular to the original Z. 
it's also perpendicular to m prime z. That's the definition of, well, it's what we had over here for the torque. So the torque is the C and mm -hmm. the C prime. Yes. And the X goes like, like this, right? Uh, it goes, let's see, you have C prime and Z. So you create a, you can create a plane. Yeah. So when you rotate the C, the other side, your, your original C remains the same, right? Yes. But when you rotate the other one, you only the line of nodes? Right, so do you agree that it's going to be perpendicular to these two? The line of nodes? Yes. Before the rotation, yes. What after, what after the rotation? It rotates with it. But it, it's no longer a line of nodes. It is a line of nodes. Isn't it only just a new x-axis? It is a line of nodes in the body axis. So you're rotating with the body, right? We're, we're not defining the torque in terms of, uh, of psi, theta, and phi. And we don't have psi, theta, theta, and phi over here. This is in body axis, not system axis. <clears throat> this is confusing, I know. Um, so, if you don't agree, then just believe me for now. <laughs> it is true. <clears throat> okay, so let's perform the analysis like before. Um, oh, let me finish replacing. So this one, one, and one. Okay, so then I1 minus I1 is zero. Which means that this whole term is zero. Okay? So that means that um, I3 omega 3 dot is zero. Omega 3 dot is the acceleration, right? In, along the C axis, the axis of rotation. So it means that omega 3 is a constant, right? So the spin is constant. I3, you know, the principal moments of inertia are also constants. And so this whole thing is a constant. That's a good thing. It's going to make things a little easier. So um, last time we assume that, and we can do that again, that omega 1 and omega 2 or 0. So initially, there's no rotation along um, this plane. And it's not rotating because it's not rotating like this. <clears throat> but um, If this is true, then initially this one is zero. Oh, thank you. Omega three in general is not going to be zero because it comes from here. So when you integrate, you have a um, constant of integration that you could make zero, I guess, uh, with initial boundary conditions, 
but in general you have that constant so in general omega 3 is not zero <clears throat> so in any case this term is zero but you have a torque that means that omega 1 dot is different than zero and so that means that omega 1 will in general be different than zero which means that this term which maybe originally was zero is not going to be for long and so uh, you have this term it has to be equal to zero because you don't have a torque along that component and so omega 2 dot will have to kick in in order to keep one to keep this one at zero and you start ro your rotation but notice that this one is unaffected okay so <clears throat> the the torque is going to change omega uh, these two components which are the ones that are like this, right? So you're gonna be you can rotate the the body like this, but this motion is unaffected. Mm -hmm. For the last expression, for the last equation, since omega three is not equal to zero, does that mean that I term is equal to zero? Yeah, let me think about it. Um, no, this is omega dot. It's not omega. It's the acceleration of. So there's no acceleration in along that axis. Okay, so I thought it was important to like you know really go through the details of this one and. If you disagree with me here, then you know where your disagreement is. So go through this process. <clears throat> so the important things, this is unaffected. And you have this motion only. The torque is going to, to, to produce this. Okay, so I guess I can write that down over here. So this is a consequence of the symmetry. If these two are different, then in general, this motion will be affected also, the spin. But because of the symmetry, uh, it is not. So the Lagrangian, we derived it before, yeah, uh, last time. It was I1 over 2 that is in terms of the Euler angles. Uh, these two, you know, the, the kinetic energy, there will be I1 over two, omega one, 
squared, omega 2 squared, Ah, uh, this is 3. Ah. Okay, so this is, remember that we just made a substitution, we derived um, omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3 in terms of the Euler angles using the, the rotations. And so notice that this one over here uh, only depends on omega 3, which from the system of equations, we know that it is a constant, it is unaffected. So this one over here is a constant. Then we derive the, <clears throat> there's two cyclic coordinates. There is no, there is no uh, phi, and there is no psi. There is theta, theta dot, phi dot, and psi dot. But these two, are not there. That means that the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to psi, this will be um, the generalized momentum in psi is zero. Uh, we also have that the generalized momentum in phi is zero. Does it make sense? So this one is a constant, as it should be. Okay, so this one is. Um, Oh, sorry, with respect to that and that. So, I guess in the interest of time, I will write the final expression. Uh, this one is going to be I3. Psi dot plus phi cosine theta. So we have, I guess, no term over here, no psi dot over here. We don't have it either. Over here, we don't have it either. So we only have this part. Um, we have this two, you move it over here. Well, I guess you can um, take the square of this term first. You get these two terms. You're going to get a psi two psi dot, phi dot, and so on. So I'm going to, this one over here, um, we derived it before. Can you tell me what it is? Look at your notes. Omega three, good. So this is I three, omega three. Again, a constant and I'm going to make, well, I guess it's not my magic, it's the book's magic. I'm going to call it I1A. Can I do that? If A is a constant? Is it allowed or no? No matter what you think. Hmm? It's a free constant. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. So I guess at this point, 
Uh, do not think that this is a principal moment of inertia. So you have two constants here. That will be equal to a, a, well, another constant, I guess another two constants that you have control over. So that's fine. Um, but yeah, suspend your disbelief for a little bit. The other one, this one over here, is longer. But what we're going to get is I1 sine squared theta plus I3 cosine squared theta that whole thing is being multiplied times phi dot okay plus I3 cosine theta and this one is uh, even more difficult to believe but let's call it I1b. Can we do that? Well, this is a constant. So can we make that equal to two constants that are multiplied and we have control over them? Yeah, we can do that. I guess. Doesn't need to make too much sense at this point. Um, but we have the two generalized momenta that are constant, and we made them equal to these two constants. <clears throat> there is uh, a third constant, which is, uh, where should I put it? I'm going to put it up there. What is the third constant? What else is conserved in this system? The energy? Yep, the energy. So the energy is I guess yeah let's be lazy right um, well actually I should have kept the other one but so remember that this one is I3 omega 3 uh, over 2. Uh, squared. Okay, so these are our constants of motion of this system. We have two momenta, and the momenta along two of the uh, Euler angles and the uh, total energy. The rest of this lecture is algebra. Um, I had a, I guess another motivation of why you could do this. Uh, but then, you know, I thought that it doesn't really matter because these are just constants. But if it helps you, uh, remember that when we were looking at the, the torque free system, um, capital omega, so the, the frequency of the precession, was in terms of I3 and I1. So I guess it was um, I3 minus I1 over I1 omega 3. 
So I guess it's not you know, too horrible to think that you can do that or something similar here. But it doesn't really matter. This is not illegal mathematically, so you're fine. Um, so from this equation over here, what we're going to get is an expression for for uh, psi dot. So it's going to be I3 psi dot equals I1A minus phi dot cosine theta. And you know we can divide by I3. So we can move this one over here. I'm going to put it like this divided by I3, and so that is phi, uh, psi, as a function of phi and theta. This is a constant, these are the uh, non-constants. And then from this one, we do the same thing. The expression that we're going to get is So this one, we move it over there. Um, and then we divide by this term. Mm, actually, we can multiply the whole thing. So it'll be I1B minus uh-huh this one i three phi dot cosine squared theta, this one. This one, we can put this one in there. So it will be plus I one A and it's being multiplied by cosine theta and I three. That one is dividing by I3. So it's A cosine theta minus I3 phi dot cosine theta. That's equal to I1 over B. Uh, this one and this one, they cancel each other. So we get rid of them. And so you have this one and this one. This one we move it to the other side and from here we isolate, we solve for phi. So, I'm just... This um, the expression for the side. Hmm? The expression for the side, I think uh, there should be an I3 coefficient, B coefficient to the second term. Yeah, there's, there's coefficients, I didn't put them in. So the final expression is this one. I one B minus I one A cosine theta divided by I one this one sine squared theta. Okay, so we have phi as a function of theta and psi or psi dot as a function of well, this one we can put it. We can put this one in there. Yeah, this um, the especially for the side. Then there should be I three in front of the second term. There should be I three. So this one. No, I three 
in front of Tita and Fardot. In, in front of Theta? Where's Theta? Like inside the cosine? No, like, uh, like I3 should be, come before that expression, phi dot cos theta. Check. Uh, that that makes sense. Let me check my notes. Maybe I made a mistake. Um, uh, where's thirty six? I missed it just to, just now. Okay. Um, so this one, it looks like this. So I want B. Yeah, so all of this is fine. If we put this one um, over here, then we end up with psi dot equals, wait, uh, this one can be simplified further, yeah. So we have I1 and I1 over here. So we can, it's equal to one. So we can get rid of it. And it's starting to look decent. And the last one is going to be I one A divided by I three minus cosine theta, and then this one. B minus A cosine theta divided by sine square theta. And then the I3s are going to cancel out. Okay. So what is important up here is that your energy and your Lagrangian depend only on theta. This is because of the symmetries of the system. So the problem is actually one dimensional, which is kind of cool. It means that we can analyze it more easily so the, the energy, now we can put it in terms of this, is going to be
So there's about two or three algebra steps that you can um, check in my notes. Which I already uploaded. Okay, so that's the energy in terms of A, B, I1, I3. Um, there's a few more things that we can do to simplify it. This is a constant, so we can move it over here. You know, just, it's just shifting the energy, it doesn't do anything. The zero of the energy. And what is really important to notice here is that this term depends on theta, and this one depends on theta dot. And it's actually, there's a square there. So what is that? No? <laughs> Close? I don't know. You're, I mean, it's definitely something simple. Well, it's, um, if you were to write the Lagrangian, you have the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So you have a, a pseudo, I guess you have an effective potential, potential energy. So this is just equal to, you know, some kinetic energy. It's not, let's call it K prime. I don't know, let's call it K, star, so that you know, we don't get confused with this meaning, minus B star. So it's like, it's, it's a, functionally it's, it's very simple. Like it's kind of the simplest you can have. So Gustavo, are you going to teach us? Uh, nah. <laughs> I think it will be better if we do it in a study session. Someone asks okay. Okay. Um, so this is cool. You know, we have we reduce these. You know, just like in the case of uh, central forces, we reduce these to a one-dimensional problem with an effective, you know, one 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 body. So it's an effective one body, one dimensional problem. And I guess that's why it's a whole section in the book, because you can do something like that. And it's all because of the symmetries of the system, of course. So let's, uh, let's try to analyze that equation. I don't want to get rid of it, but I will. I guess I don't have an option. Okay. I one A is equal to I three omega three. So 
I1 squared, A squared, divided by 2, I3 is I3 squared, omega 3 squared, divided by 2, I3. This was the last term, the constant that we had at the end. Okay, so here we can cancel out this one and this one. And we can move it to the other side. And let's call that one E prime. Let's call it, uh, it's fine. I'll call it E prime. So E, this one, going to be equal to e prime is e minus this constant. So we shifted the zero. And so if we multiply times two over here, divide by i1, we do the same thing on this side. What we're going to get is two divided by I1, we got rid of the last term because we moved it, so it's just I'm just rewriting the energy over here. But we're multiplying here. So if we define alpha as 2e minus i3 omega 3 squared divided by i1, so this part over here, then alpha is 2 e prime divided by i1. <clears throat> so we have this part over here. So alpha is just equal to whatever we have inside here. Cool. So alpha is this. It's also equal to this. And of note is that alpha is a constant. We can define another one, another constant, beta. Beta is going to be 2mgl divided by i1 constant. We can just substitute in here. Um, yes. So it's going to be I1 beta. And now everything is being multiplied by I1. missing this I1 but we can divide everything by the I1 and so this is what we're going to end up with okay <clears throat> so alpha is ah and we had the two also OK, 
Okay. Ah. It's difficult to fall. There's no two there. Okay, so... This is our expression for this shifted energy. And so A from this definition, A is the generalized momentum in psi divided by I1. And B is a generalized momentum in phi divided by I1. So all constants, A, B, alpha, and beta. This is, uh, well, this expression, because we have theta, is not a constant. So, if we make one, more substitution, u is cosine theta, then cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to 1. So cosine squared theta is 1 minus one cent squared, so one minus cosine squared theta. So this one is u squared. So cosine theta is u, sine squared theta is one minus u squared, uh, and theta itself is the r cosine of u. So if we want the dot and the square, we have to do the same thing on here. So the derivative of the r cosine is minus one over one minus u squared, square root of that, and then whatever is inside. So it's going to be du dt, since we are taking the derivative with respect to time. So that's u dot. And this is a, I have a question. The, the theta dot squared, uh -huh. how we remind it to the other expression? Uh, from here. So we're defining u as cosine theta. So we take the r cosine of u is going to be theta. And so then we just take this one squared and we get no negative there. So it's u dot squared divided by 1 minus u squared. So u theta dot squared, which is the other expression that we have over here, is equal to these. So we can rewrite the, the equation in terms of u and u dot. And it's going to be alpha equals u dot squared divided by 1 minus u squared, that one, plus b minus a u, a u, 1 minus, I still don't get how the dots came about. I feel, to, 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 to get it, I know this arc uh, cosine of u, theta itself is arc cosine of u, so why are we having the dots? Uh, well, we need this one. Right? You're saying that, could you repeat that? 
Okay, we said if we said let e equals the cosine of theta. Yes. And to get theta, theta itself will be the arc cosine of u. Right. So, so what are we having with that? That's what we have over here. Oh, because we want to get this one. So we know what theta is, but theta is actually not here on by itself. We have theta dot squared. We're not deriving it from the equation. We're finding what it is from our definition of u and plugging it in. OK, so this one is uh, squared. And then this is beta u. So we can rearrange it. And it's going to be, I'm going to use a different color and use uh, red. So we solve for u dot squared is equal to 1 minus u squared times alpha minus beta u minus b minus a u squared that's it okay so we said that we were able to simplify it to a one body one dimensional problem and that's what we have over here So from this equation, you can get these are all of our constants, so I'm going to leave them here. So if you want to get the time, um, this is du dt squared. So you take the square root of that. Um, you move dt over here, and you move this equation over here, and you integrate. Then you get. Having there. Right, and well, this should look familiar. It's just like the, the central force. So if, if you remember, in general, these integrals are pretty nasty, but they're solvable. I guess if you're really good at uh, um, elliptical integrals. But the nice thing about this equation is that you can um, analyze it more uh, qualitatively. So we're going to let uh, this one be equal to f of u. I still want that drawing. Um. Okay, these are. 
Okay. You could analyze how many clicks per second my brain has, right? By the time I say okay. I don't know how we could, like, got the uh, that expression. Yeah, so you have u equals cosine theta. If you take the r cosine of u, that's the r cosine of cosine theta, and by definition, that, that is theta. And then uh, you take the derivative of that. And the derivative of the r cosine is negative 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. So you can look up the, well, I guess you could, you could do it if you're really good at um, calculus. So this is the derivative of r cosine. So you get this one, and then because of the chain rule, you get whatever is inside of it. So it's going to be theta, it's going to be d, um, du, we're taking the derivative of the r cosine, dt. And this one is u dot. So u dot. You want theta um, squared. So you have to well, first take the dot and then do the square. And this one is just u. So then you have this one squared and this one squared. This is 1 over 1 minus u squared. And this one is u dot squared. That's equal to theta dot squared. Because you did everything on both sides. Now the same thing, the same things on both sides. But it's also, uh, it's in my notes. Just check backward. Okay, so, oh shoot. So, we do the multiplication over here. And so F U, and you know, I don't mean it in a bad way. I guess f of u sounds better. It's um, beta u cubed minus alpha plus a squared. Um, u squared. plus 2ab minus beta u plus a minus beta alpha minus beta um, minus b squared. Okay, so you have the term, I guess, you know, just to be consistent, we have all the terms. So uh, independent of u, linear with u, quadratic, and cubic. So this is a cubic equation. Um, there are a few things that you can that you can look at. And so, if it's cubic, how many roots is it going to have? Three roots. So maybe it will look like this, right? So. If beta is equal to zero, then this becomes a quadratic equation. So you will have two roots instead of three. In what case will beta be equal to zero? When there is no gravity. So no torque. Um, you know, so the no torque, I guess, no torque but a fixed point case 
is a subset of these. Uh, if you have a, if you if the top is on a plane, then theta, which is the vertical, uh, the angle with respect to the vertical, is between zero and ninety degrees. Right. So, if that is the case, then you. Um, well, I guess in general, u has to be between plus one and minus one. So, you know, it's going to be over here. This is the range. So this will be u equals negative one. And over here we can put u equals plus one. So this is what you can have, what the math allows you to do. The physics, if we're looking at a plane, only allows you to be between zero. So cosine, cosine zero is one, and cosine 90 degrees is zero. So the physics only allows you to be in here, okay? If you look at this equation, if u goes to positive infinity, um, if u goes to positive infinity, then f of u goes to positive infinity. So this one has to go up. If u is negative infinity, f of u is negative infinity, so this one has to go down. Okay? So this is it. This is the only shape that you can have. There's another condition. If u is equal to 1, then uh, f of u is going to be f of 1 is minus a uh, minus b squared, and f of negative 1 is minus a plus b squared. Okay? So a and b, they're positive. The momentum has to be positive. I guess worst case scenario it is zero. So this term is positive, this term is positive, this is negative. Okay, so um, one of the roots, so over here it has to be negative. And over here it has to be negative also. Okay, so that means that one of the roots is outside of your allowed range. You're gonna have that root mathematically, you cannot get to it. Um, if you have something like this, this is in the non-physically allowed region, so you cannot have this one. That means that this, this curve has to look more like this. Okay? So this, these two roots have to be in the zero to one range. There's another option, another possibility, that maybe this one goes like this. And so it only touches the f equals zero axis at one point. So in this case, your two roots are degenerate, right? But this is essentially what the physics um, and math allow you to do. And uh, without going into the details, um, This is theta, well, related to theta, and so we had our expressions for phi and for psi. So theta is the mutation, right? So you can know what will happen to 
phi, I guess this one too, but it's just, oh, this one is unaffected. Um, so phi is the only one, the, the other that is affected. Phi is the precession. So you have a combination of stuff over here that will result, if you look at the unit sphere, I'm almost done, just final drawing. This is theta one, this is theta two. In this scenario, um, we're gonna put u prime. u prime is a over b. And it's related to phi, okay? to phi, oh, this one is dot, dot. So you have, this one gives you the mutation. It's gonna go in between the two roots. You know, just like when you throw something up, um, the root of that equation tells you the, the, how do you call this point? The velocity changes signs. Uh, it goes up and down. It's not stationary. I will remember how it's called. But so this is where the velocity of theta changes sign. So it goes from it go and can it can only be there. So it's like turning point. Turning point. I'm not sure. Turning point. So you know if you have like something that moves in this potential, like a ball. It goes here, and then it goes back. So over here, you have the turning points. Okay, so the velocity is zero here, and it starts to go in the other direction. It's the same thing here. These are the turning points. So you have the mutation. So it, 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 it's going to do this. And then based on where you put this one, you're, you're going to have the precession. So you could have this scenario in which the precession is always in the same direction. And th this is how your, the wobbling is going to look like, right? If you put The, free, the, the, the angle, phi, in here, then you're going to have this scenario. So the precession goes in this direction when the mutation is down like here, below this angle. And it's gonna be in the opposite direction when the notation is over here. So it's gonna make loops. And if you put the notation at one of the roots, like here, then this is gonna look like, that one in particular is gonna look like this. So it's going to touch at only one point. It's going to be, um, this one's going to be one direction. This one is going to be zero. So it looks like that. So you know, based on the interaction of the constants, so A, B, alpha, and beta, you get these different behaviors um, of the top. So you know, I think this is kind of cool. Okay, um, let's send it here. Thank you for the extra time.